I want to insist what our duty really is, is to, we need to give a specific diagnosis when possible because this really helps guide management. And what we need to consider in addition to, of course, the sonographic characteristics is the age and menopause status of the woman, a potential risk factor for ovarian cancer, such as, for instance, familial history of, of uh, ovarian cancer or Lynch syndrome, if there are any clinical symptoms, and also lab abnormalities such as CA125. So we really need to have a global picture of the patient. And so when we talk about evaluation of adnexal mass, ultrasound is widely accepted as a first imaging modality. It will involve not just transabdominal, of course, endovaginal and color and power Doppler. And, you know, several studies have shown that expert sonographic interpretation is highly accurate in differentiating benign or live alone lesion from potential malignant masses with a high negative predictive value. So we leave MR for characterization of adnexal masses that are indeterminate ultrasounds. So it's a problem solving modality which has high sensitivity as well as specificity for identifying malignant and benign masses. CT really doesn't play a role except perhaps for characterization of dermoids in the, uh, you know, characterization uh, of adnexal masses, but of course many are found on CT and it's really important, of course, in the staging of uh, cancer. So what we'll talk about is illustrate key sonographic characteristics of benign lesions that we can readily diagnose and review sonographic criteria that will answer the, help answer the question, is this mass likely to be an aggressive or invasive ovarian cancer or is it likely benign? And we'll discuss some indeterminate masses because all this is really important in terms of allowing us to formulate a clear conclusion and offer uh, appropriate recommendations. And I will discuss them as we go along. These are the simple rules from IOTA, the uh, uh, international variant tumor analysis. Um, the SRU is more focusing on the Nexal cyst in their more recent paper. And then there is finally the ORADS uh, from the American College of Radiology, which tries to be a very comprehensive management strategy to classify risk of ovarian or Nexal mass being you know, malignant. And so I would encourage everybody to adopt at least some of them to try to make it uniform throughout your practice, especially if you have a very large number of radiologists such as we have at NYU or we had at Hopkins, um, because that will allow you to offer recommendation for management based on current evidence-based practice. Of course, we do that after discussion with the referring clinicians, uh, but that will allow us to minimize unnecessary follow-up imaging and also referral to the appropriate specialist. So let's first talk about benign adnexal masses that we can readily diagnose. And the first one is an ovarian cyst in a premenopausal woman, which is more ovarian, ovarian lesion, I should say not really mass. And you have simple cysts, which is basically a failure of the follicle to uh, involute, or hemorrhagic cysts, which is thought to be failure of the corpus luteum to involute. These tend to be symptomatic. And then, of course, a thicker luteal cyst in cases of hyperstimulation or gestational trophoblastic diseases. So this is the most common lesion in 50 or younger women, a simple anechoic cyst. And the recommendation has changed a little bit recently. So if it's less than 3 centimeters, it's basically considered normal. Between 3 and 5 centimeters, the SRU guidelines suggest that you don't really need to do a follow-up in these premenopausal women. Between 5 and 7 centimeters, if it's really simple, uh, you can think about it, but most will recommend a follow-up in 2 to 6 months. And over 7 centimeters, definitely a follow-up and possibly suggesting another imaging modality because above this size, it's really difficult for ultrasound to be sure that this is a simple cyst. And this is just you know, an example of a corpus sudum, which is you know, fluid. Uh, vascularity around it that we all know about and you know this because of this vascularity that they can you know sometimes bleed and become hemorrhagic cysts. Now in an older woman it's a little bit different so this is a 76 year old woman which has an adnexal mass you see this about four and a half centimeter it's also completely anechoic with a thin wall so it's a simple cyst and if provided that it's unilocular 
that has thin wall, there is no color Doppler or just high resistant flow at the edge of the cyst, we've seen that many of these women, um, you know, screening of asymptomatic postmenopausal women, about 3.3 to 15% will have these cysts. And uh, particularly 10% of postmenopausal women on tamoxifen will develop cysts. So it becomes a dilemma what to do with this. When do we need to worry about them? When we need to follow them? So the recommendations are that you check the, the C8125, it's normal. If it's less than 3 centimeter and you're comfortable with a simple cyst, you probably don't need to follow. Above 3 centimeter, you do 3 to 6 months for characterization and then 6 to 12 months for growth. And then yearly afterwards, at least until stability is assured, is what the general recommendation is. Because the natural history of these cysts is either they remain stable or they resolve over time. Now, if there is any of these, the cyst enlarges, or there are mural nodules or thick septations, then I would recommend perhaps before surgery at least get an MR with contrast, or also in cases where the patient's really anxious or unable to undergo regular ultrasounds, then you need to maybe you know, have MR or even laparoscopy. And in those patients that have these cysts removed, some of the pathfinding that have been reported as serous or mucinous cyst adenomas, pair ovarian or endometrial cysts that have done dormant in these postmenopausal women, or hydrosal banks. The only thing I would say is be very careful when you call this a simple cyst, especially in older women, because you can have reverberation artifact near the, the near wall, and that's fine. But sometimes this can hide nodule. If you see in this case, this is not just reverberation because you shouldn't have reverberation artifact in that corner. And if you turn on it actually in the corner, you see that there is a neural nodule. And this turned out to be a small ovarian cancer in the patient that had an elevated CA125. So we really have to be careful before we call something a simple cyst. Now, sometimes if the cystic mass is more than 10 centimeters and both the iota and the ORAT will talk about size and generally when the cyst is more than 10 centimeters, then something else needs to be done about it. But if you have a cyst at large with some of these features, predominantly cystic mass, no septations or a few very thin septation, no mural thickening, no flow or high resistance flow, then this is likely that it's at least very likely to be benign and this patient may undergo an MR and then get a GYN surgery. And this turned out to be just a very large benign serous cyst adenoma. So these are some of those features that in the cystic lesion would favor the fact that this is going to be a benign cystic neoplasm. Now we are familiar with the next very common, the next cell mass, which is a hemorrhagic cyst. Uh, if you see a retracting clot with these acute angles, or if you see this lace-like or fishnet appearance, they will have, they will be avascular, of course, because this is just a blood clot with maybe some flow at the edge of the lesion. And sometimes they can have a fluid, fluid level. And in these cases, it's very easy, straightforward diagnosis. If they're five centimeters smaller, there is really no need to follow up. If they are larger, perhaps you want to do the follow-up in 6 to 12 weeks to make sure they resolve. And it's the same rule if you see an ovarian uh, cyst on CT in a young woman. You basically apply the same rule. You don't really need to get an ultrasound to follow up. If they have an atypical appearance, such as this one, which looks more solid, then of course you'll get a follow-up. And you can see that this patient came a little bit earlier than we suggested. But anyway, it had already uh, resolved. Another lesion we can diagnose with confidence is endometrioma, which is basically functional endometrial tissue outside the uterus. And there is a diffuse form that basically forms scar tissue, but the chocolate cyst is what we're talking about here, which is a localized endometriosis of the ovary. And they have a very typical appearance. They can be multilocular or unilocular, but they all have this diffuse ground glass low-level echoes. They can have septations, but the other thing to look for is this, this echogenic fossa in the wall. That's very characteristic of endometriomas. It's basically probably debris from hemosiderin from the hemorrhoid. So that, look for that if you think something is an endometrioma. And of course, if it's a large cyst, such as this one, it's more than 7 centimeter, 
You can see again that this has a typical brown glass appearance. Then you may want to do an MR just to confirm. And basically, there will be high signal intensity on T1 because of their uh, blood content. And there's a characteristic T2 shading that you see, again, due to the hemosiderin content of these lesions. Now, be careful again, because this lesion, if you look very quickly, also looks like there are diffuse low-level echoes. However, this one has nodules, right? So there are nodules, like these soft tissue nodules, then the, this is not an endometrioma. And this turned out to be a borderline serous tumor. Now, another lesion that we can readily diagnose is the, this one. This was a 56-year-old woman with breast cancer, so you can imagine that she was very anxious. But we can reassure her because this is indeed an ovarian mass, more solid appearing, but it has these typical echogenic lines within it, which is characteristic of a cystic teratoma dermoid. And this is the dermoid mesh. Now, these are quite common, probably one of the most common ovarian neoplasm. They can be bilateral. They mostly are seen in young adults and pregnant women, but 8 to 10% are found in postmenopausal women. They contain derivatives from all three germ layers. They have very characteristic ultrasound features. Dermoid mesh or echogenic mass with shadowing. And this is another, that's the only solid mass. If there is shadowing within a solid mass, if this is part of the iota simple rule that will also be a dermoid. They may have calcifications. And they may have some other appearance, such as a fat fluid level or floating echogenic balls. And if you have two or more of these signs, this is a really old paper, but this is all true. This is 100% positive predictive value for the lesion being a cystic teratoma. So this is a small echogenic mass in the ovary. This is a lesion. That's why this has, we have talked about a tip of the iceberg. And because some, there is so much shadowing, and the shadowing in this case is probably from fat mixed with hair, you don't see the borders of the lesion. That's why it's called a tip of the iceberg. Now, sometimes they have less uh, different appearance. So this is a lesion that has a fat fluid level with a hairball. That, that floats at the fat fluid interface and also the Wachitansky nodule here. And the CT confirms the presence of actually bilateral dermoids. Uh, this one is very large, but again, it has these floating hairballs and this one also has this characteristic shadowing. So we can be pretty confident that this is going to be a cystic teratoma. And this large size perhaps might not be a bad idea just to get another uh, study such an MR to confirm. Plus, as we'll see in the next in another talk, they are at risk for torsion. And this is, however, a very a typical appearance. This patient had pain, and really in this mass, it, it's a solid appearing mass, and there is no shadow. And so, really in this particular case, we cannot be comfortable that this is a dermoid, and so we're going to get a CT, but also an MR with fat saturation, the T1 with fat that confirms that this is fat in this lesion, and this is indeed a cystic teratoma, but this is an atypical lesion. You would not be able to make a comfortable diagnosis on ultrasound. Now, again, be careful, because the nodule, if it's a cystic mass and there are echogenic nodule, you want to make sure that there is shadowing to call it a cystic teratoma. In this particular case, there is no shadowing, and this was a high-grade ovarian cancer. Now, another lesion we can comfortably diagnose is a hydrocelpings by its tubular appearance. And when you look at it on cross-section, uh, you can see the, uh, the thickened fimbriae. So that's an easy diagnosis to make. You know, again, you can get a sense that it's tubular, even though portion of the fallopian tube is more distended. And this patient did have an MR that confirms her diagnosis. Again, she was 56 years old, uh, so we wanted to make sure. But this is another comfortable diagnosis you can make. Another one is a pair ovarian cyst, which is a simple cyst, probably from one of these embryologic remnants in the broad ligament, so it's separate from the ovary. And of course, and this is important to recognize that they're separate from the ovary because they're not going to change. They're not functional cysts, so you just have to call it a simple pair ovarian cyst. And then finally, 
Peritoneal inclusion cyst is also a lesion that we can often comfortably diagnose. What it is basically is trapped peritoneal fluid because the ovary will secrete some fluid and because of adhesions around the ovary, the fluid will not get resorbed and will be trapped. Usually these patients have a history of prior surgery, pelvic inflammatory disease or endometriosis. They usually a lesion of premenopausal women with active ovaries. And the important thing to rec recognize is that they have a passive shape. They don't create mass effect. They tend to surround the ovary, as you can see here. So to summarize, these are benign lesions we can diagnose with certainty. We can put it in our report and basically reassure the patient.